what we've got here is um, uh, Governor Phillips Commission and Instructions under the Act of Parliament establishing the colony um, and it sets out the procedures for, this, for civil and criminal courts and gave Philip wide powers to appoint public officials. Um, he also under this document had the power to pardon criminals except for murder where royal assent was required and he was instructed to commence cultivation especially of the flax plant uh, and to establish a settlement at Norfolk Island as soon as possible. He was authorised to emancipate, emancipate convicts for good behaviour and industry uh, and to grant land to them but he was not given the power to grant land to marines. His instructions in respect of Aboriginal people were as follows and these are from his orders. To endeavour by every possible means to open an intercourse with the natives and to conciliate their affections, enjoining all our subjects to live in amity and kindness with them. And if our subjects shall wantonly destroy them or give them any unnecessary interruption to the exercise of their several occupations, it is our will and pleasure that you do cause such offenders to be brought to punishment. The important point in those orders is that it's very clear from the orders that the Crown made the distinction itself that its subjects were separate to the Aborigine natives or the Aborigine natives of this land. Um, so clearly from the get-go the Crown acknowledged by its own writings and its own declarations in respect of this land and the, and the governor for this land that the Aborigine people were not British subjects, they were not subject to British law. Um, governor Philip, um, we might add, and, uh, uh, didn't comply with these rules, these, these uh, lawful uh, instructions that he was given and acted outside of them. Um, that is a, a story for another day. But um, suffice to say, his his breach of these orders means that he was acting as an individual and not as a, an employee of the Crown. And everything that he did was obviously therefore without the blessing of the Crown. Um, unless, of course, the Crown wants to admit and accept that it was responsible by proxy for Philip's actions of uh, slaying, uh, murdering and raping and pillaging Aboriginal peoples that had actually assisted him and his colonists when they arrived in Australia. Um, the same people who, if they hadn't have helped the colonists, were slaughtered by the colonists. Um, it, goes to, it goes to show the belligerence of the Crown and its servants in this land. Um, we might also, the interesting, because we're talking about sovereignty, um, there is an interesting account from 1796 from a chap by the name of, of Collins who wrote in respect of Benelong, he, and he wrote the following. Their spears and shields, and this you've got to remember, this is from a contemporaneous personal journal of someone who was there at the time. This isn't me saying it. This is not John Howard or Kevin Rudd saying it. This is not the Queen saying it. This is from a journal of a person who was on the ground at the time that this took place. Now, he says that in 1796, their spears and shields, their clubs and lines, etc., are their own property. They are manufactured by themselves and are the whole of their personal estate. But, strange as it may appear, they also have their real estates. Benelong, both before he went to England and since his return, often assured me that the island Memel, called by us Goat Island, close to Sydney Cove, was his own property, that it was his father's and that he should give it to Bygone, his particular friend and companion. To this little spot he appeared much attached, and we have often seen him and his wife, Bang Barangaroo, Barangaroo uh, feasting and enjoying themselves on it. He told us of other people who possessed this kind of hereditary property, which they retained undisturbed. If Ben Long's remarks, now this is, this is uh, an aside to, to the statement from the journal, but if Ben Long's remarks to Collins about property had not been made until after he came back from England, we could assume that Ben Long had learned of the concept of ownership of property from the British. But from the very time the British arrived and started to communicate with these people, people like Ben Long started to make the point, this land is my land. It is not my brother's or my uncle's land. This is my land. We had a title. We had our own title. Back in the days of old, we knew who owned what. We still know who, who owns what. Don't you forget that either. Um, you know, uh, the, the fact that the British Crown turns around and, as they've stated in writing recently to us, um, claims sovereignty by, by uh, claiming radical title, which was against their orders, which was against the, 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 the laws of their own parliament in that they were not allowed to extend their sovereignty into this land. Um, these people still went ahead and did it willy-nilly because their attitude was, hey, hang on, we're, we're halfway around the planet. 
You know, it's going to take them nine months to get here. What can they do about it? By the time the information gets back to them, it won't even be the truth. All right? And we only need to look at the writings between um, uh, Governor Philip and um, uh, uh, one of his, one of his uh, subordinates when they were both back in England to see that the conniving between them to keep the truth from the Parliament and the Crown was such that they could, if they did this, they were able to manifest for themselves significant interests in this country. Now, that in itself, for, 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 for Governor Philip to have an interest in this country, under the terms that he held that interest, or took that interest, um, uh, at the time was utterly improper. But nonetheless, they did it. You know, we're talking about men who are motivated by greed, not integrity. And, and that has been the problem with the basis of Australia. Australia has been, you know, the Commonwealth of Australia has been constructed on the basis of, 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 of a fight amongst greedy men to usurp authority from the people, regardless of original or non-original people, and, and take from those people their right to land, their right to assets, their right to freedom, and confine us to this life under a, under a, a, a corporate regime where our government is a corporation. They give us a corporate identity at birth and then try to abuse our human person by way of the corporate system. Um, that again is a story for another day, but nonetheless it's as relevant as the rest of this tape. Now let's get back to uh, Captain Arthur Phillip. First of all, we acknowledge the fact that being Captain Arthur Phillip, he was a naval officer, so everything he did was pursuant to uh, admiralty law, not the common law. And we know that the common law prevails on land, not admiralty law, not statute law, which is what admiralty law is. Now, we we're aware that from previously that, that he was given orders that he that he was effectively, and he, he and his uh, fellow settlers and convicts, and I use the term fellow convicts not loosely, um, were to come to Australia and they were to effectively, the instruction was that they were to, to acknowledge and respect the sovereign position of the Aborigine peoples. They weren't to interfere with their right to occupy their lands. Okay? But one of the first things that, that Arthur Phillip did was to issue an order. And this is, this is how the order reads basically uh, Philip ordered that a party consisting of four, four officers and 40 marines were to be ready to leave quote tomorrow morning at daylight now one of his officers that was in the colony at the time Tench uh, provides the following he says and he, he, he transcribed the orders and he said his ex excellency informed me that he had it pitched upon me to execute the foregoing command we were if practicable to bring away two natives as prisoners and to put to death ten, as ten warriors that they were to kill, and to destroy all weapons of war, which evidences warfare, which evidences war. And just as a side issue, we must remember that, that when it comes to proving sovereignty, sovereign people only have to prove two things to have established their sovereignty under international law. The first is the ability to war and make and wage war, and the second is the ability to, to govern or control themselves, okay, as a people. So here we have evidence that they had weapons of war, which one would assume they must have been using in respect of a war. Um, and then, he's, then the orders say, and that we were to cut off and bring the heads of the slain, ten heads, ten slain warriors, for which purpose hatchets and bags would be furnished. And he goes on to say that he was determined to strike a decisive blow. This is Captain Arthur Phillip in his belligerence and arrogance. He was determined to strike a decisive blow in order at once to convince them, the originally owners of the land, of our superiority and to infuse a universal terror which might operate to prevent further mischief. Now, it's quite ironic that the British government, when they were thieving the lands and the resources of other races, would use terror as a tactic. And he goes on to say that he was determined to strike a decisive blow. This is Captain Arthur Phillip in his belligerence and arrogance. He was determined to strike a decisive blow in order at once to convince them, the originally owners of the land, of our superiority and to infuse a universal terror which might operate to prevent further mischief. Now, it's quite ironic that the British government when they were thieving the lands and the resources of other races, would use terror as a tactic. But now that um, uh, those same British uh, uh, 
the same British nation and its, its enclaves in various other sovereign lands, like for example Australia and America, now would use uh, the term terror to describe thugs and, and, and uh, uh, land thieves and um, people who would oppose them in their practices. Well, it's quite ironic that, that, that back in the day, they even described their own, they amongst them described their own behaviour as terrorism. They were the ones who initiated the terrorism, which is still ongoing in this country, against Aborigine peoples. It's as simple as that. Another thing about Arthur Phillip, um, it's interesting to note that the British government, um, who is so sure about the righteousness of their claim of sovereignty in this land, somehow, somehow, don't ask how, somehow have managed to lose Arthur Phillip's diaries and journals. Now, one would assume that these things would have been kept had their position been lawful, had their position been just, had their position been the position and the actions of good Christian men and women. One would assume that, uh, you know, they would have kept these records to be able to show for the full course of history that they had a legitimacy, a lawful right to do what they did. But obviously, because they didn't, these documents have disappeared. They've been lost into time. But as bad luck that is for us, the worst luck for them is that, that we have a myriad of other documents. We have people coming to us all the time now with documents. We don't keep them here, say, bust into my house and take what you want. We don't keep them here, but they're safe, okay? Um, we have got some incredible documents. Um, and I'm not getting off the point of Philip. Um, we've got to remember that, that Philip was supposedly come here as a naval officer um, without any particular right to establish an interest in the colony, right? With no legal right at law to establish an interest in the colony. And we see here that um, the cattle had disappeared from Sydney Cove in 1792 and were found at cow pastures near Camden, near Sydney, in November 1795, and their numbers having increased to more than 60 head. When this came to Philip's notice in England, the former governor wrote to King, who is the current governor, who was also in England on sick leave at the time, sounds a bit like Robert Menzies, um, uh, and told Governor King that as two of the five cows originally lost were Philip's property, or my property, I therefore have an undoubted claim to a share in the cattle found to have increased in so extraordinary a manner. Now Philip sent this note, this letter, um, and he gave his, his interest in the cattle to King to dispose of as, a, as you may judge proper. And in March 1798, Collins reported that 170 head had been seen in the area, and in 1804, a party sent to the area by Governor King mounted 800, they counted more than 800 wild cattle. Now, even on today's market, that's, that's, that's a reasonable sum of money. You know, 800 or 1,000 bucks a head? It's not bad money. It's, it's, it's no small interest, particularly. Like, you know, and, and, these, and these people were supposedly, according to themselves, acting in an admirable manner. Um, no, they weren't. They were acting in an admiral manner. They were acting under admiralty law. They were stealing, thieving, raping, pillaging. They were doing everything that was okay by the British admirals, everything that the British admirals had endorsed, contrary to the laws of their own king and parliament. In other words, everything that they were doing here was utterly illegal. Captain Cook, arriving in Sydney Harbour with a piece of, piece of wood with a rag attached to it, stuck it in the ground and said, I claim this for my sovereign. I claim this in the name of my sovereign. Well, if someone can explain to me the logic of putting a piece of stick with a rag hanging off it in the ground and they can explain to me how it is that logically that means that he took ownership for a third party. Can you, can you under British law at the time, British land title, can you explain how that works? You know, my understanding is that, that if you steal something from someone, ownership is not vested in the, new, in the, in the recipient owner. Um, my understanding is that if someone receives something that is stolen, that is a crime. It's called receiving stolen goods or benefit by deception, etc., etc., etc. Um, these, are, these are the terms they use against Aborigine Australians or Aborigine Australian people to lock us up. If we're involved in crimes, like for example, stealing someone else's property 
or trespassing on someone else's property, um, we can be locked up under their law, the same law that they use to steal our property that they, are make, they now claim as theirs. This flies in the logic of everything I was ever taught at school. It flies in the logic of everything I was ever taught from my parents and, 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 and my, my community as being socially acceptable. I don't understand why it is that, that Britain has a monarch who, regardless of who the monarch is from time to time, as they've always claimed that they are just and that they are righteous and that they are there on, on God's behalf to do God's will and to exercise his authority. Um, uh, but these same people continually <laughs> go out and send others out in their name to break their own laws, to break the laws of their God upon which their own laws are supposedly based in order to rape, pillage, thieve, steal, con and consort with other criminals for the benefit of the same crown that's putting forward this proportion that they are um, all high and mighty. They are the regal. They are, they are the queen. They are the king of the parliament. Big deal. Even that in itself, if we have a look at everything that they are doing. They, their claim to be someone special by being the monarch of the parliament of Great Britain is in itself a fraud fundamentally flawed. Why? Because the Queen of the Parliament of Great Britain, Queen Elizabeth II, is merely a glorified public servant. She has a position as a result of the Act of Settlement 1701 UK. If that act did not exist, she would not have a job. She doesn't have a throne because the Parliament has the throne. The throne is inside the Parliament. She has a job sitting on the throne inside the parliament. Ask the Queen, can she create a law? Can she write a law and hand it to the parliament and say, there you go, now that's law from this day forward? No, she can't. Why? Because she works for them. They don't work for her. So the concept of, of anyone being able to come, particularly in, in 1770 or afterwards, particularly from 1701 onwards, when the Act of Settlement was created, the concept of someone acting on her word as opposed to acting in accordance with the law of her parliament, is a farce for Captain Cook to claim that he came here and took this land for he, in the name of his sovereign is a joke because his sovereign doesn't have the capacity to receive stolen goods without breaching her own law. Yes? And if that is the case, then how, it is, how is it that the parliament itself, who owns both the, the ship that Cook came here on, owns the office within the Admiralty that he was working in respect of and owns the crown that he was serving and owns the Parliament, how is it that the Parliament can be consorters? How can they be consorters to this criminal act and not be exposed? You know, we only have to look at exactly what's going on in respect of Australia now and the British Crown to see what's happening. Ask, write, write a letter to the Privy Council and ask the Privy Council, better still we already have and we can show you the, the returns, Ask the Privy Council whether or not they have appointed the past five Governors General of Australia lawfully. We can tell you, because we have it in writing, that the Privy Council denies any allegation that the last five Governors General were lawfully appointed according to the requirements of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia. And even if they were, they were appointed by a power foreign to the Commonwealth of Australia, and that would mean that the fact that they have not been lawfully appointed means that every law they've created or appointed the past five Governors General of Australia lawfully. We can tell you, because we have it in writing, that the Privy Council denies any allegation that the last five Governors General were lawfully appointed according to the requirements of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia. And even if they were, they were appointed by a power foreign to the Commonwealth of Australia, and that would mean that the fact that they have not been lawfully appointed means that every law they've created or given supposed royal assent to is null and void, void ab initio. Or, if they have been appointed according to that law, they are an employee of a foreign power and every law that they have given royal assent to is void ab initio and illegal, can't be used. You know, um, th this whole thing's a farce. You know, it's, it's not a matter of me standing here and saying it. These, these are just the cold, hard facts. These are the cold, hard facts of, of life in respect of this country. There is no document of acquiescence. There is no treaty. 
You know, we only have to look at the documents from back, uh, the contemporaneous documents from the time that Australia came into being. And, and all the way down the line, the orders were, we should treaty with these people, we should treaty with these people, we should treaty with these people, we should stop the war. But the fact is, the thieves who came here uh, uh, in the name of the Crown um, and with the blessing of the Crown, but in utter ignorance by the Crown of their actions, have just continued to rape and pillage. They have no morals, they have no ethics, they have no scruples. And that continues to this day with our current government. A government who would who would who would break its neck to turn Australia into a republic, just to avoid the issue, the obligation, and the necessity of dealing with the indigenous Australian people, the original peoples here, acknowledging our sovereignty, and dealing with us with the respect that we deserve, and and dealing with us when it comes to issuing mining rights over our land. You know, we've got a government who takes 100% of the royalties and hands 15% of the royalties over to the sovereigns. This has got to stop. It's not good enough. And regardless of what Mr Rudd does and says, and regardless of what Mr Rudd's thugs uh, uh, in their blue jackets do and say, um, stopping me is not going to stop this. This information is out there for the world to see. Um, you know, the, the fact is that the time has come. The time has come for Australia to stand up and start behaving as an adult because we're sick and tired of being told what to do by a bunch of inbred ingrates from a foreign power. We don't need that anymore. The British claim that because they, they exercised or for, rather forced um, their laws over the original people in Australia that, that this illegal act of forcing their laws over us gave legitimacy to the continuation of that illegal act um, of the use of British law against us, um, uh, it's 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 a it's a it's an interesting statement. Um, uh, you know that effectively um, they are talking about a, a couple of cases where uh, Charles Kilmeister and six other colonists were tried before Mr Justice Burton in Sydney in, uh, um, uh, in December 1838, and they were executed for the murder of two Aboriginal children and an adult Aboriginal named Charlie. And they claim that this shows how the English law has been applied in criminal cases between the colonists and the Aborigines. Um, it's interesting, it states here that uh, the uh, report says that they are aware, however, that Mr M Montgomery Martin, in his history of this colony, thus mentions the case of the Aboriginal Black Tommy, who was hanged for murder in Sydney in 1827. The circumstances, he says, uh, connected with the execution were very similar and deserve publicity. From the statement previously made to me, I believe that the, I believe the man to be innocent, and I therefore attended his trial to aid in the defence of a man who knew not a word of our language and owed no obedience to our laws. And the judge even made the comment himself that he was not sure, quote, that I can legally exercise any jurisdiction with reference to any crimes committed by the Aborigines against each other. Now, this 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 uh, select committee was. Um, uh, 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 the reporting, the, the, the select committee's review of, of uh, the interaction with Aborigines is very interesting. There were a number of very important points made and acknowledged by the Parliament through this committee document. And I ask, I ask that question again, as, as asked by the judge of the day. Could the judge legally exercise any jurisdiction with reference to any crimes committed by Aborigines against each other? And the answer is obviously no. The British had no jurisdiction over anyone other than their own subjects, and as a matter of fact, the issue of jurisdiction was that was that um, um, obscure and that remote and that removed from the possibility of them having jurisdiction in this country. The issue of jurisdiction wasn't addressed by the Parliament until uh, 50 years after this this committee, because they knew they knew themselves. Hang on, we don't have the right to do this. I, I, can I judge these people? No, I can't. But why can't I? Because they're not subject to our law. The the early settlers knew this. There was no there was no uh, 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 obedience required by Aboriginal people to British law, and there still is not. And 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 I say that not to tell people that oh, hang on, Aboriginal people are above the law because we're not. We're subject to our own law, and our own law, quite frankly, is far more harsh in respect of its penalties than than British law. And one of the reasons that Aboriginal people don't like the British law is because we know, we inherently know from the day that we are born, that we aren't British subjects.
we're not subject to British law. Um, this this uh, parliamentary committee uh, reviewed a whole range of different issues relating to the issue of sovereignty and the issue of possession of land and the issue of the exercise of jurisdiction against Aboriginal people. Um, uh, comments made, for example, um, uh, the report further states, quote, it might be presumed that the native inhabitants of, of any land have an incontrovertible right to their own soil. It is a plain and sacred right which seems not to have been understood by the British. Europeans have entered their borders uninvited and when there have not only acted as if they were the undoubted landlords of the soil, but have punished the natives as aggressors if they, if they evinced a disposition to live in their own country. Now, what right did they have to do this? The fact that they just had a belligerent disregard for the laws and the rights and the civil rights of Aboriginal people pursuant to Aboriginal law doesn't mean that they were a superior race or from a superior nation or from a superior society or that their laws were superior or in fact that they had somehow usurped our law with their law. Um, that, is, that is cold hard fact. We can't get around that. There is no evidence that they that, that law was ever lawfully usurped or jurisdiction was ever ever lawfully usurped and we must also remind the judges in the courts currently um, of a statement made by one of the lords during this 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 review he said that a judge must not rest the law to his authority in other words a judge must not get hold of law and twist it and turn it and manipulate it so as to give himself authority and this was what happened in Australia the judges over the last X amount of years in the Supreme Court of New South Wales in particular and the magistrates courts or local courts as we call them now these people have turned around and they've exercised the jurisdiction they knew that they did not have what did they do they took the law and they rested they wrestled with it they brought they brought the law to subjection of their own mind so that they could have a jurisdiction that they didn't lawfully possess and don't lawfully possess and that was one of the things that this 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 uh, uh, parliamentary report said hey the judges should not do this in the colonies. Now we see Mr. Sachs Bannister, the formerly Attorney General of this colony, uh, in his evidence before the same committee on the 31st of August 1835, after complaining that in his time in New South Wales uh, an interpreter between the Aboriginal people and the courts was unable to be found um, to come into any court of justice. And he says to the, in, his, in, the, in the report to the committee, he says, we ought forthwith to begin at least to reduce the laws and usages of the Aboriginal tribes to language, to Aboriginal language, um, and print them, and direct our courts of justice to respect those laws. Why? Why, if they had jurisdiction, should they respect our laws? The reason being that the people knew, the various of the people knew, or they all knew, there was those who chose not to take notice, but they all knew that the Aboriginal people are sovereign. The original people in this land are sovereign. They have their own systems of laws. They cannot be usurped, could not be done lawfully. He says, hence it is evident, according to Mr. Bannister's testimony, that the, the Aborigines of the colonies, a colony have laws and usages of their own. Mr. Bannister also handed a paper to Mr. T. F. Port to the committee. He says, we ought forthwith to begin at least to reduce the laws and usages of the Aboriginal tribes to language, to Aboriginal language, um, and print them and direct our courts of justice to respect those laws. Why? Why, if they had jurisdiction, should they respect our laws? The reason being that the people knew, the various of the people knew, or they all knew, there was those who chose not to take notice, but they all knew that the Aborigine people are sovereign. The Aborigine people in this land are sovereign. They have their own systems of laws. They cannot be usurped, could not be done lawfully. He says, hence it is evident, according to Mr. Bannister's testimony, that the, the Aborigines of the colonies, a colony have laws and usages of their own. Mr. Bannister also handed a paper to Mr. T. F. Buxton, Chairman of the Committee, dated 19th of August 1835, in which, under the heading of Measures Affecting the Swan River, River and Other New Australian Colonies, he makes the following statement. Make treaties with the natives before proceeding further. I'll just quote that slow and clear for the British so they're going to watch this. Make treaties with the natives before proceeding further. Also, in a letter from Mr John Batman, um, we can read, and this letter was enclosed uh, in a covering letter by, by Governor Arthur, 
from Van Diemen's Land on the 4th of July 1835 to the Right Honourable T. Spring Rice, who was the then Lord Monteagle, and he was then uh, Her Majesty's Colonial Secretary of State, Mr. Batman states, quote, The chiefs, that is, the chiefs of the Aboriginal tribes of Port Phillip, to manifest their friendly feelings towards me, insisted upon my receiving from them two native cloaks and several baskets made by the women, and also some of their implements of defence. The women generally are clothed with clo cloaks of a description somewhat similar, uh, and they certainly appear to me to be of a superior race to any natives that I have ever seen. Thus, according to these statements respecting the Aborigines, it appears that they are by no means devoid of capacity, that they do have laws and usages of their own, that treaties should be made with them, that treaties should be made with Look, when you, when you start looking into the documents, the, 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 the journals and the, the uh, mementos of these, the, or, or memos that these people wrote, the insistence on, on, on the creation of a treaty or establishment of a treaty between the British government representatives and the, the Aborigine peoples, it's, it's, it's splattered all over the place. These, these references, these, these cries for a treaty to be made, um, are everywhere, but ignored every time. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, the the, uh, the, uh, the the fact that a treaty is not uh, in place at this point in time um, clearly shows the belligerence of both the governments of Australia and England in respect of um, their, 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 their utter belligerent refusal to respect the sovereign nature of the existence of the Aborigine peoples. They've done everything. They've moved this mob from over here into this mob's land and then set this mob up to fight against that mob in their own land. So, you know, the old divide and conquer techniques, but it hasn't worked. Yeah, there's a few blackfellas out there that have, that have taken the government purse. There's a few blackfellas out there that have sworn allegiance to the Bar Association and the Law Society to make a dollar. Yeah, well, everyone's got to survive. Um, you know, it's always open to them to to stand up and be counted for the truth, um, you know, it's up to them as to whether or not they take they take that offer to do that. Um, but the the offer door's always open, you know. It's not an offer that I can make. It's not an offer that anyone can make. It's an offer that they must make to themselves, and they must take up of their own accord. Um, surely they can see the truth the same as we can. It makes us wonder why they're on the other side. Not that there's sides in this argument. Also within the report is a statement. Um, uh, it's a very interesting statement. I'll just read it in the, from the report. Much will, this is the parliamentary report. Uh, much will depend on the manner in which this colony is considered to have been acquired. And this brings me in the second that place to advert some of the laws, uh, sorry, advert to the laws of, the, of nations as acknowledged by the British government with regard to colonial possessions. Now the term law of nations means international law. That's what it was called at the time. Um, colonies, says Mr. Clark, in his summary of the colonial law, and stated at the bar by Mr. Barry, are acquired by conquest. So here we have them saying the colonies are acquired by conquest, right? Um, by secession of under treaty. So that's the second one, or uh, by occupancy. So they're either occupying vacant land, they're taking lands by someone giving up or acquiescing under treaty, or um, it is uninhabited country and they have just acquired by conquest, or rather the inhabited country acquired by conquest. Now, by occupancy, where an uninhabited country is, this is what the report says, by occupancy, where an uninhabited country is discovered by British subjects, and is upon such discovery adopted or recognised by the British Crown as part of its possessions, that's the first method of taking possession, or acquiring the land. In the case of a colony acquired by occupancy, the law of England, then in being, is immediately an ipso facto in force in the new settlement. Uh, Mr Clark further states, the New South Wales and Van Diemen's land were acquired by discovery or simple occupation. Now, New South Wales was not, however, unoccupied. As we have seen at the time, it was taken possession of the colon by, by the colonists a body of Aborigines appeared on the shore, armed with spears, which they threw down as soon as they found the strangers had no hostile intention. That is from Smythe's journal of the date, the time that this happened. Alright, 1788. This being the case, it does not appear that there was any conquest. 
because there was if these people stood there and they had come to some tacit unspoken agreement you're not hostile towards us we don't need to defend there's no conquest so it wasn't take wasn't taken by conquest it wasn't taken by any of the other two legally required methods so obviously the crown did not meet its own uh, uh, legal requirements in respect of taking possession of this land it also says and it is admitted that that there has hitherto been no session under treaty and we know that mr howard um, um, quite ironically it's not it's not ironic it's quite understandable mr howard's mentor would be robert menzies but we'll come to a statement by him later um, it's interesting that uh, mr howard made the statement in 1996 one of the very first things he said when he came to power there is no treaty between my government and aboriginal people of australia not a problem we knew that mr howard we knew we've never ceded sovereignty you know it was admitted by the british parliament the only people who can't admit it are you blokes now protectors indeed have recently been appointed to certain lands set apart by order of government within the district for the location of aborigines but no more this colony then stands on a different footing from some others as it was neither an unoccupied place nor was it obtained by right of conquest and driving out the natives nor by treaties so how did they take it oh they just walked in and said hang on this is ours well burnham burnham did that in london and we know how farcical that was burnham burnham himself by doing this acknowledged the farce of his claim for for sovereignty over british land but it wasn't himself that he was laughing at and it's not burnham burnham that we laugh at when we think of that we know and we we, we acknowledge the idiocy of the british claim of sovereignty over us by doing the same thing you know someone walking onto your land and throwing a, a stick in the ground with a rag hanging off it and claiming it for someone else or themselves stupidity utter stupidity but one of the very interesting things indeed as mr m vattle very justly says and this is uh, uh, mr vattle was one of the uh, the uh, members of parliament at the time whoever agrees that robbery is a crime and this is all oh, oh, this is this is a direct quote from the 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 uh the, the report Whoever agrees that robbery is a crime and that we are not allowed to take forcible possession of our neighbour's property will acknowledge without any other proof that no nation has a right to expel another people from the country they inhabit in order to settle it herself. Whoever agrees that robbery is a crime, and this is, oh, oh, this is, this is a direct quote from the, 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 uh, the, the report, whoever agrees that robbery is a crime and that we are not allowed to take forcible possession of our neighbour's property will acknowledge without any other proof that no nation has a right to expel another people from the country they inhabit in order to settle it herself no nation and this is a contemporaneous quote a quote from the times that this was happening they said the parliament said we don't have a right to take someone else's land we don't have a right to just walk in and forcibly remove them from the land and take it. We, are, we only have to look at what was happening in the Parliament at the time all this was happening. We're leading up into the period where William Wilberforce came forward and did his job and gave notice to the Parliament that the Parliament accepted and then gave notice to the, to the Crown and to the people and to the admirals who didn't listen. We don't have a right to take someone else's land. We don't have a right to take someone else's life and enslave that person. You know, why is it that the British could acknowledge this, the, 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 the Parliament could acknowledge this, and the Crown could acknowledge it, but the Admirals couldn't? And that is, therein lies the, 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 the question that needs to be answered in respect of sovereignty in Australia. Why can't the Admiralty accept they don't have jurisdiction nor possession in Australia? Why can't they accept that? There's, there's one other very important aspect of sovereignty that that um, has to be dealt with by itself as a separate part of this video and, and here it comes those of us that declare our sovereignty and those of us that intend to declare our sovereignty bear in mind one very very important point as a sovereign you have an immense responsibility not to breach our common law as amongst ourselves not to steal, not to, to rape and pillage, not to uh, um, denigrate anyone else's rights or privileges 
we have to understand that if we're going to take upon ourselves our sovereignty and, and be who we are, we have to remove ourselves from the system, but in doing so, we have to protect others from, from us. We have a responsibility to ensure that, that we do not um, commit the same transgressions against others that have been committed against us, because that makes us no better than those that we're standing, standing up to. We have to remember, as a sovereign, you do something wrong, you get the full weight of the law. You get the full weight of our law. And believe me, our law comes a whole lot quicker and a whole lot sharper and a whole lot faster than the British style. You cross our law, you pay the, you pay the toll for it. And that is the way it is. If you're a sovereign under our law, you are a sovereign under our law. And you'll be treated to the full extent of it. All right, um, any, any brothers and sisters or uncles or aunties out there that uh, would like more information or like some assistance in some way in respect of our sovereignty, um, there's names and, and phone numbers at the end of this movie or this video that uh, uh, give us a call. Uh, those of us that have been involved in the making of this, this uh, video will, will gladly assist in any way, shape or form that we can, bearing one thing in mind, and that is there, there are limitations in, in respect of our resources at this point. And, and, and just in closing, if we really want to know where where we stand in respect of our politicians and whether or not our politicians have any respect for Australia under their own law, we've got to remember that the last Prime Minister we had, John Howard, publicly and clearly stated that his idol and mentor was Robert Menzies. I'll quote a comment made by Robert Menzies on a plane flight back from England during the first uh, Second World War. He made the following quote... I get a sick feeling of repugnance grazing me as I near Australia. That was a comment made by the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, under British law, over British subjects only. Um, that was his comment in respect of Australia when he came back from England. That was on the plane trip back. He stated how coming back to Australia made him sick in the stomach. It's no surprise then that he packed his marbles and went back to England. No surprise at all. And it's no surprise given the, the behaviour of Mr Howard's government towards the Indigenous sovereigns of this land and its belligerent indifference in respect of the sale and the theft and the sale of our natural resources. Um, it's not surprising that Mr Howard, um, in his utter lack of integrity and scruples, would, would acknowledge that Mr Robert Menzies, the person who made that statement about Australia, um, is his idol and mentor. I don't think much more needs to be said to that. I think it puts it all into perspective. What I think is the attribute that separates humans from non-humans is that humans care for each other. We look after the weak, the young, the sick and the old. Insofar as somebody is human, one has concern for other human beings. That's just the basic attribute of human. Yo, I'm Peter Ridgeway. I'm sitting in the Gurung Nation here today. Um, why I'm sitting here today, I'd like to, while I'm sitting here today, I'd like to honour the ancestors who have fought hard for the last 200 or so years to give us a life today. You know, we're sitting here in this country that has had much warfare practised upon it, and it's just an honour to sit here and know that why we are alive is because of their efforts. Now, what my ancestors and our ancestors didn't know is the legal ramifications of being sovereigns on our own land. Why we're sitting here today and talking about sovereignty is to show the, show the people that um, 
once you uh, proclaim your continuing sovereignty, because we already have sovereignty, once you proclaim your continuing sovereignty, we're using um, a channel that sovereigns only use. And this is the education that was uh, denied our ancestors. In the case of the act of war, I'd like to share with you now today about the very, this very act that's on this piece of paper in front of me. It was an order that was given by Governor King to Sir Charles Mackenzie's at the time, who became the, um, the boss of the settlement of Newcastle, which sits in, which is Mullumbimba, within the Garang lands. I'd like to share that with you now. You are therefore hereby required and directed to take upon you the charge of command of the said settlement, and I do hereby charge you and command all of His Majesty's subjects that may be within our command to obey your directions, as you may from time to time receive from me, and any other of your superior officers to the rules and discipline of war, for this may be this shall be your authority, my emphasis in bold, pertaining to the rules and discipline of war. The point is we're the ones who have the sovereignty here. So what I'm seeing, what we're doing here in this generation, in this country, is using our sovereign rights, using it, using our natural rights and using it through you know, natural law. And that's how sovereigns operate. They don't operate in civil rights. Civil rights is given by a government. And at this point here, in this time, in this present moment, we're not British subjects. So we're not subject to the laws that have come to dominate our lives. They simply have no jurisdiction. Uh, g'day to you all. My name's Daddy Daddy Bunjil. Um, I've also given another name, I suppose, by, by, the, by the English when they come to this country. They, they made us take out, they made our parents not take out birth certificates to register us in their corporation, the name they give me there was Arthur Ridgeway. But um, for all attention and purposes, my name is Daddy Darabanjil, and I am a Katang man, and I swore allegiance to my country the day I was born, but I also signed a declaration of continuing sovereignty on the 30th of March, 2008. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's very pertinent for me to tell you that I was born a sovereign and all my ancestors were born sovereigns. We have never ceded our rights in this land. We have never acquiesced anything to any purported government or realm on the face of this earth or to our neighbours in our own country. We didn't acquiesce. But what I want to do with you is walk you through a, a little timeline on what's actually happened in this country. You know, I've got a bit of a paper here. I'm, I'm going to read from it in, in short parts, you know. Um, it's a short, concise, uh, really reference to the facts uh, that are a truthful account of sovereignty on and over the continent, what is now called Australia. You now, in 1701, the UK Parliament passes a Settlement Act, 1701, UK, which limits the monarch capacity of that of a monarch in Parliament. This means that the monarch is merely a public servant with no lawful right to operate over or outside the law. Very important. You know, in 1770, Captain Cook discovered Australia. I, you know, I was kind of wondering how we lost it, because I don't think we ever lost it. It was always here. So I don't see how anyone can discover our lands if we was on it since the beginning of time. In 18, uh, 1788 to 1900, various British subjects of various capacities, from criminal to officers acting under instructions from the Admiral, of the UK occupy certain areas in Australia without the consent of the original sovereign owners. In 1836, on February 1836, letters patent established the province of South Australia. And these uh, letters patent were created, were created by uh, King William IV and included text stating, and this is very important, provided always that nothing in those our letters patent contained shall affect or to be constructed to affect the rights of any Aboriginal native of the said province of the actual occupation or enjoyment of their own persons or in the persons of their descendants of any lands therein now actually occupied or enjoyed by such natives by writ of the Privy Seal. 
Now, when you look at that statement, that statement says one thing. That statement says, do not interfere with the sovereign rights of the original people whose country you are settling in. Do not interfere with their rights on their lands, their rights to live the way they want to live on their lands, or do not hinder or obstruct their sovereignty in any way, shape or form. This, is what, this was their king telling them that. But as we know, history set a rather different course because they didn't take notice to what they were told to do under sovereign orders of their own king. Yet they went with what their admiralty thought should occur, which was an illegal, dishonest and criminal act committed on our people on their lands, or do not hinder or obstruct their sovereignty in any way, shape or form. This, is what, this was their king telling them that. But as we know, history set a rather different course, because they didn't take notice to what they were told to do under sovereign orders of their own king. Yet they went with what their admiralty thought should occur, which was an illegal, dishonest and criminal act committed on our people. The acknowledgement of the sovereign rights of Aboriginal peoples of South Australia to unreservedly continue to enjoy their lands as they always had in their sovereignty was reiterated by William IV in the order to council established government dated 23rd of February 1836, it states, And in this letter patent it contained a proviso that nothing herein shall contain shall affect or to be construed to affect the rights of any Aboriginal native of the said province to the actual occupation or enjoyment of their own persons or in the persons of their descendants of any lands therein now actually occupied or enjoyed by such natives. The Right Honourable Lord Glen Glenegg one of His Majesty's Principal Secretaries of State is to give the necessary directions herein accordingly. So that just reiterates what I've already spoken about. Our rights were infringed upon. It wasn't just an occupation, it was a criminal offence and it should be viewed as that way and looked at in history as that way and that wasn't the only thing too you know in, in uh, 1872 there was a very another document came out it was called the Pacific Island Protection Act 1872 UK it, created due, it was created due to the fact that the admirals of the UK were attempting to extend the sovereignty of the UK Parliament into the Australian colonies and the Pacific Islands contrary to UK law, remembering that is the Parliament of the UK and not the admirals who had the jurisdiction in this regard under the Settlement Act of 1701. In 1775, because the Admirals and Queen Victoria ignored the instructions of the UK Parliament legislated, legal and lawful, directions not to interfere with the rights and the sovereignty of the native sovereigns of the Australasian colonies and Pacific Islands, the Pacific Island Protection Act 1872 was amended to clarify its intent and bind on the Queen and the Admirals. The amendment stated that the Queen of the Parliament of the UK could only exercise its laws over British subjects. 1875 Amendment and that the UK Parliament had by this amendment clarified that nothing herein or in any such order in Council shall extend to be construed or extend to invest Her Majesty with any claim or title whatsoever to dominion or sovereignty over any such islands 
i.e. the Pacific Islands or places as foresaid, the Austra Australasian colonies including Australia and New Zealand, or to derogate from the rights of the tribes or people inhabiting such islands or places, or of the chiefs or rulers thereof, to such sovereignty or dominion. This Act irrefutably establishes the fact that the UK Parliament acknowledged and accepted to be sub subaltern to the authority of the true sovereigns of the concerned Pacific Islands and Australasian colonies. This Act has never been repealed. From the 1890s to 1900, the British subjects in Australia developed their own constitutional doc document, which is sent back to England, is modified by staff in the Home Office of London, passed as law and becomes known as 63 and 64 Victoria, an act to constitute the Commonwealth of Australia 1900 UK. And this British-owned act still remains the property of the UK Parliament and cannot be used in Australia pursuant to even the most basic tenets of international law. This document contains in section 127 a tacit yet clear recognition by the British and their subjects present in Australia of the sovereignty of the Aboriginal peoples and says before being repealed in 1967 section 127 in reckoning the numbers of the people of the Commonwealth or of a state or other part of the Commonwealth Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. Why? Why? The reason Aboriginal natives were not to be counted is because we are sovereigns and not to be counted as British subjects. We are not subject to British laws. In 1967, the British subjects present in Australia vote to allow the Aboriginal peoples to vote in the elections of the government of, of the British subjects. There is no mention of acquiescence of Aboriginal people's sovereignty, nor are Aboriginal sovereigns stated to have become citizens of Australia or subject to the British Crown or Government. And that goes right through, you know what I mean? And it's very important that my people know all over this country we have never ceded our sovereignty, we have, sovereignty, we have, we have never ceded our sovereignty we have never acquiesced in any shape, form to any realm on the face of this earth not even to our neighbours in our following countries we are true sovereigns we are true sovereigns of this land we have never acquiesced or given up our dominion over our lands to anybody I think more to the point is what I've actually done is uh, I've proclaimed my continuing sovereignty, which is a, an act that, uh, that only a sovereign can do. Only sovereigns can make proclamations, which are laws. Um, now, I went over many, many different acts and uh, legislations and proclamations which were given by the Crown. A lot of this information, um, I know sometimes it takes a, a while to digest a, a lot of new information which has just been given, but um, at, the end of this, uh, at, at the end of this documentary you will see our phone numbers or, and contacts there. So feel free to get in contact with us in, in any manner you wish and we will make sure that uh, if you are a sovereign in this land we will help you to become truly who you really are. I'd like to talk about acts of treason. I'd like to talk about acts of treason. The acts of treason they were committed by the admirals, namely the viceroys, namely Governor Philip, Governor King, and all the governors that, are, that have ever stood on our continent and supposedly ruled over us and their subjects. Their acts of treason that they made against their monarch. You know, we've been told throughout all their laws, their statutes, everything, their acts, that the monarchs have no sovereignty here and that their subordinates, the viceroys, the governor generals or the governors were told not to bring 
their monarch's sovereignty into our realm or the realm of our neighbours, namely New Zealand and Fiji and the Torres Strait Islanders, all of these realms upon this continent. That wasn't our doing, it was theirs. And that's the point that I'd like to make clear that the rest of the viewers who see this, you know, this is the truth and fact. This is the truth and fact. And it's usually, it's a fact that, and the truth that we've been denied as people, the, the sovereigns upon this country, or I'll continue to say continent, because this is a great continent with many, many nations. But the British subjects themselves have been also condemned to ignorance and the subjects the British subjects have to realize what their authorities have done to them and what kind of example is this set for a future republic to take place here have the same kind of leadership in place will the country of Australia ever change if you know these things aren't settled, this is what we must look at if, we, if, if, the, if the populations of this continent will strive for something better. That's all there is to that. There's no way forward in truth and honesty. We have to remember that this colony was built on lies. In fact, I'll go as far as to say this colony is ruled by a kleptocracy. A kleptocracy is governance through thievery. And this is the truth and fact. Natural law. Natural law is an international law. And it's a law of all peoples. In natural law, no person of living flesh and blood containing a spirit ever has to submit itself to a monarch or a government. In fact, all human beings, all humans, have sovereignty. We, as the Yori people here, we have dominant sovereignty because we come from this earth. These are our countries upon this continent. This movement about us standing in our sovereignty, we offer those who honour our sovereignty to come and be a part of our sovereignty, as it is always should have been 500 years ago. Uh, if people outside of our own communities will come and sit down with us, it's our responsibility to look after them. The responsibility hasn't changed. Just because the world has changed, our responsibility is still the same. And we need to look after you too. You must make the choice though. Which way do you want to go? Do you want to stay enslaved to the Commonwealth of Australia and the British sub as a British subject? Or would you like to sit down with us and honour freedom? Our law is about that. Honour the land as who she is. She'll look after you. In our ways, we can't own the land. It owns us. We can be caretakers. You can be caretakers in an honourable way instead of the way of kleptocracy, that way of, you know, thievery. Do you still want to be party to this? And I ask you this today, at this moment, if you're listening now, you've got a choice to make. You might make it now, you might make it in 10 years' time, or you might never make it, but you still have a choice to, you know, to even make a decision about this, of this, um, this very thing. It's up to you. We've made our choices to be who we are. We're sick of not being free upon our own lands. We're sick of coming under the jurisdiction, an illegal jurisdiction to us. We honour our own jurisdiction. It is God-given, and God has given as well. <laughs> it is what it is, and we live for it. This movement is fuelled by peace, 
and harmony. In no way will we want to pick up any weapons to, you know, assert our way. There's no need for it. And um, this is something that must be remembered. Just a quick word about the word acquiescence. Acquiescence means to give up your sovereignty. As like what we've been talking about, we've never given up our sovereignty, neither today nor through our ancestors. But the important thing about acquiescence to us today is that um, we can be in any position to, to acquiesce. Uh, what we're doing and being aware of where we are is never to acquiesce any of our sovereignty. And uh, brings us to the point also is that we don't need that uh, the jurisdiction of the Australian government to prove that we are sovereigns or to give us an okay or recognise us that we are sovereigns. And that brings me to think about, well, as I discussed earlier, about um, their, how much sovereignty they have. I don't think they're really a valid body to have a treaty with anyway since only sovereigns can have treaties with each other. What do you think? Have a think about that. But yeah, um, we don't need their purported authorities to tell us when and if we're sovereigns. Once someone makes a proclamation, if you've noticed other monarchs or other sovereigns have made proclamations, you'll notice that nobody needs to give any recognition to that because it just states what it is, the law. So whenever we make proclamations, we don't need to have an official response at all about anything. And what we're finding anyway is that in the governments and uh, you know the purported authority silence, this is recognition and this is what happens when you make proclamations. The recognition happens um, in that when we refuse to sit in their jurisdictions or their courtrooms, then it is honoured, meaning we're not going to get carted away to jail and things like that. because. That's not where we're meant to be, and it's a legal act that any of our people, our brothers and sisters and cousins or aunts and uncles, who have ever been in, sitting in a courtroom, you know, that is an illegal act. No one was meant to be judged. We're not to be judged as a people because we are sovereigns. Uh, my name is Mark McMurtry. Um, this short video is about um, dealing, or what we're going to be dealing with is the, the uh, illegality of the use of British law in Australian territory, the fact that the Crown never lawfully extended its sovereignty to Australia, and the fact that our political so-called masters and so-called leaders um, have absolutely no uh, credibility at all when it comes to their purported legality and that of their governments. Um, the whole process starts back in uh, 40,000 years ago, then we take a mighty leap forward until uh, 1701. And in 1701, the British Parliament created an act which established the, the Crown and its authority um, as a statutory monarch or a constitutional monarch in the British Parliament. One of the, the limitations on the monarch was that the monarch was uh, limited by paragraph 7 or section 7 of the, uh, the uh, Act of Settlement 1701 UK in that the Crown was not allowed to extend its sovereignty outside of the uh, dominions of England, Scotland or Ireland without the consent of the Parliament. Now, we only have to look at documents, and, and we're, we're talking about a line of contemporaneous documents including the Hansard of the British Parliaments, um, uh, uh, letters patent issued by King William, um, and letters patent issued by subsequent monarchs, um, we can step forward from, from 1701 to 
1836, when on the 19th of February, King William IV um, uh, signed letters patent in respect of the establishment of the, uh, uh, or the proposed establishment of the province of South Australia. And the letters patent contained only two items. The first item was a de description of the boundaries of the proposed province, and the second item that it contained was a proviso. And the, the establishment of the province was subject to the proviso that uh, contained in the letters patent that the rights of the Aboriginal people within the territories of the proposed province of South Australia were not to be interfered with. Their right to occupy and enjoy their land in the persons of themselves and their descendants was not to be interfered with. That was the basis, the very basis, of the uh, creation of the province of South Australia. Um, there are contemporaneous or, or documents in time with that. Um, if you have a, spend time and research the Hansard of the British Parliament, um, with, although I'm quite sure by the time the, the British Parliament gets to see this video, the sleaze buckets there would have made sure that those documents aren't available to the public, but I can assure you that the Hansard of the Parliament of Great Britain clearly shows that uh, um, the attitude of the Parliament was, and the monarch was, that they were going to start, lo and behold, they were going to start to respect the Indigenous peoples in whose lands they were, um, or their representatives were as settlers. Um, we step forward from 1836, uh, the 19th of February, to the 23rd of February, 1836, when the letters patent uh, um, for the office of the Governor of South Australia were issued. Um, you can go to the Governor of South Australia's website and you'll read the proclamation by, King, by, by the Governor, um, Governor Hindmarsh, uh, when he arrived at uh, Glenelg, uh, in 1836 and it's uh, 28th of December he arrived at 2 p.m. in the afternoon he came ashore and there was a, a statement made and the statement was that uh, one of the things he was going to do was to punish with ex extreme severity um, uh, anybody who interfered with the rights and the privileges of the indigenous or the, 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 the native owners of the uh, province of South Australia again this is all contemporaneous the documents come from the same time they say the same thing um, it's not like that we had this one standalone document whereby our sovereignty was protected by the Crown, um, or the purported Crown. Um, 1836, we go forward to 1875, bearing in mind the Settlement Act 1701, that the, the Crown was not allowed to take its sovereignty outside the dominions of England, Scotland and Ireland without the consent of the Parliament. In 1875, the amendment to the Pacific Islander Protection Act 1872 um, contains some very important statements. Section 6 of that amendment stated very clearly um, and without any doubt that um, the only jurisdiction that the Crown and the Parliament of Great Britain had in the colonies was over British subjects. Aboriginal people could never ever um, be slated as being British subjects. Uh, never have we acquiesced to the British Parliament, never have we acquiesced to the British Crown, never have we given over or given up that that we own and currently still own, um, which is the lands within the dominion, or the so-called dominion, of Australia. Um, we must also remember that the 1875 Section 7 of the Pacific Islander Protection Act states that, that the uh, uh, Queen Victoria and all subsequent monarchs were specifically excluded from extending or construing to extend their sovereignty into the dominions, into the uh, Australasian colonies and Pacific Islands. Uh, it's, it's interesting to, to try and sit down and fathom how it is that supposedly intelligent people who had a grasp of the English language, which after all was their own, um, how these people were able to uh, uh, misconstrue or lie um, to the people and somehow claim that they had taken sovereignty in this land. I have a recent letter through a, a, a friend in Newcastle, who, the, this letter states uh, from Fred Marr, uh, got back from the Attorney General. The Attorney General, Commonwealth Attorney General, claims that they, they, the uh, the Crown extended its sovereignty here and took radical title over Australia. Um, interesting concept because here we have absolute monarchs, in uh, absolute absolute sovereigns in the Aboriginal people, who are absolute sovereigns over their land. Down here we have a constitutional monarch who is governed by her Parliament, a Parliament that says she can't bring her sovereignty here, and she's claiming that somehow with her lower degree of sovereignty, um, she somehow usurped and overrode the, the, the absolute sovereignty of the Aboriginal people against the, the, the instruction and the laws of her parliament 
um, which means she cr committed a criminal act, um, and she's claiming that this, and, and, the, and the British and the Australian governments claim that this is all well and good. Um, the problem they face is that, that history doesn't lie. It can be misinterpreted. You only have to read the history books that are, that are shoveled out to our kids in school, and you'll see the, the lies and deceit that our kids and we have been taught. Um, I remember when I was at school, I, I learned all about the wonderful this wonderful country that I was living in called Australia. And uh, as I grew up, I, I, I began to realise that things weren't as well as they seemed on the outside. The biggest issue being that the authorities claim a jurisdiction that they've never, ever lawfully had. We've got We've got judges who preside in courts under British coats of arms in Australia. We've got a constitution that is section 9 of a current piece of British legislation uh, entitled 63 and 64 Victoria Chapter 12, an act to constitute the Commonwealth of Australia 1900 UK. Um, our constitution being section 9 of that, the first eight sections being the covering clauses that state clearly how section 9 is to be dealt with lawfully. Um, and in section 9, when it was created, and we have to remember that this document was, was drafted by white Australians, and this is not a black and white issue, but it was drafted by white Australians in, entire, in total absence of any representation by the Aboriginal people. Um, and this document was created only to be used in respect of British subjects, because obviously British law can only have jurisdiction over British subjects. Now, and we only have to look at Section 6 of the Pacific Islander Protection Act to see that the, the, uh, the uh, Crown only facilitated through the Pacific Island Protection Act uh, jurisdiction over its own subjects. Uh, so, so how it was able to claim that it had jurisdiction over Aboriginal people, I'm not sure. The, the, the Crown had this uh, uh, bigoted ideal that somehow it was able to take that that wasn't it, it, its and somehow claim we have radical title over this land. Well, it doesn't matter who you are, if you take something that doesn't belong to you, nothing more or less than a common thief. And if you conspire or consort with those people to uphold that, you're lower than them because you know what the truth is and you've had the truth exposed to you and what are you doing? You're upholding the lie. How these people sleep of a night I don't know. They must be mightily proud of themselves. Uh, people to uphold that, you're lower than them because you know what the truth is and you've had the truth exposed to you and what are you doing? You're upholding the lie. How these people sleep of a night I don't know. They must be mightily proud of themselves. Um, uh, the, the thing is though, if you have a look at their constitution, in section 127 of the, the document was originally drafted and originally uh, supposedly given royal assent, even though we know it wasn't, um, the constitution stated at section 127 that the Aborigine people and the Aboriginal natives of Australia were not to be counted as a part of the Commonwealth, the population of the Commonwealth or any part thereof. Now if we are not part of the Commonwealth or any part thereof or any part of the population of the Commonwealth or any part thereof, we can't be subject to their law particularly given that it is their law in our land and their law cannot be used against us. Now, uh, regardless of what they say, they claim they took radical title. Well, they can claim what they want. Um, uh, it's like native title. Radical title is a legal fiction. Native title was, was created merely to give the government some sort of a leg up to jurisdictional prudence that they don't have and never will have in this country. Uh, it, it's a fraud. Native title and all the people who, who push for native title in the courts and the courts that support this are doing nothing more than supporting a corporate fraud. The judges on the benches that are, that are upholding native title decisions against the, the interests of Aboriginal people are committing fraud against the Aboriginal people. These men who sit on the bench and are so high and mighty in their self-indignant importance, these people should have a good look at themselves. The problem is, though, that regardless of what they do and say, the facts remain the facts. And the fact is, they do not have jurisdiction in this land. Section 127 of the Constitution was repealed in 1967. The non-Indigenous Australians, who were subject to the laws that stem from the Constitution, decided to change their Constitution to make reference to us. Bad luck. Because you change your law to make a reference to us in our land, when your law only has jurisdiction over yourself, does not mean that the jurisdiction of your law extends to us. There is no treaty, John Howard said himself. There is no treaty between my government and the Aboriginal people. Thank you very much. The only time John Howard actually stated something that was true in his whole 10 or 11 years in Parliament. What he stated in, in, in layman's terms was, there is no legal instrument, there's no legal document, there's no treaty that evidences an acquiescence or the giving up of the sovereignty of the Aboriginal people to the British Parliament or the Australian Parliaments. So how do they gain... How do they gain 
jurisdiction over us? How do they gain sovereignty over us when we've never acquiesced our own sovereignty? And our sovereignty is, is of, of a higher standard and a higher credibility and holds much more integrity than the, the unlawful, fictitious sovereignty they claim that they brought here to Australia. And another important thing is the fact that, that um, uh, King William IV was very clear in his instructions. Um, and when he signed laws as the monarch and gave them royal assent, he signed laws that, and letters patent that gave very limited jurisdiction and power to his representatives, or the, rather the Parliament's representatives in Australia. Um, uh, he made it very clear that the, the Aboriginal people in this country were not, or in particular in the province of South Australia, uh, at, at that specific time that I'm talking about, um, when their rights to occupy and enjoy their land now, were, were not to be interfered with. Uh, a sentiment strongly endorsed by the Governor of South Australia on his arrival at Glenelg on the 28th of December 19, 1836. Um, now, if you want to get a, a, a sort of a, a Hollywood version of this, which is pretty close to the money, go and watch a movie called uh, Amazing Grace. See what William Wilberforce did. See, see the influence that that had on the Parliament. Have a look at what the Parliament was doing at the time, where their head was. They, they denounced slavery. They took slavery away. They, they, the Parliament did not want to know about slavery. They'd finally woken up to the fact that just because you have white skin doesn't mean that you are of a superior race. Um, you know, uh, the, it, it is a fact that pursuant to the laws created by the British Parliament, which govern the British Parliament's ability to extend its sovereignty and all the the British Crown's ability to extend sovereignty outside of the uh, jurisdiction of Great Britain, they had no lawful authority whatsoever under their own laws to extend sovereignty into this land. Now, they can argue all they want. Their law is their law. Their law never has had jurisdiction over Aboriginal people in this country. Never has had and cannot have jurisdiction over us until such times as we acquiesce and give it jurisdiction. The fact that they have beaten us into submission in most cases, um, arrested our people, slaughtered our people, have a look at what that police officer uh, did in, in Queensland, murdered a man and the courts upheld it. it was accidental, you know. Um, you know, he, he split the man's spleen in half with his knee, but oh, it was accidental, you know. He flogged the man to death, oh, it was accidental, you know, he ran into me fist 40 times, we've often heard that joke. Um, this is this is the way it is. The, the whole thing is a farce. It's based upon a lie. So in order to maintain the lie, you have to lie. But the problem with maintaining a lie with a lie is that ultimately, that's all it is. It's a lie. It's a, fix, it's a fiction. It's a nullity. It's a void. And what their law is void of is any integrity. Any integrity whatsoever. No British law has jurisdiction in this land. No British law. The constitution of this country, as I said earlier, is British law. You know, if we have a look at we have a look at the fact they that both the Australian government and the British government admitted that in 1931 and 1942. In 1931, the British government said, in, through the, the Statute of Westminster, that no British law was allowed to have jurisdiction in Australia. Again, the Parliament's trying to make the point clear here. And what did Australia do? Australian Parliament, in all of its wisdom, turns around and says, "We will adopt." the British law that states, and, and they did this by way of creating the, the Statute of Westminster Adoption Act, they said we will create this act here that adopts the British Act that says that no British Act can have any authority here. Now, let's get back to the facts here. The reason our parliamentarians behave like this is quite simply because of the fact that they, they know they don't have jurisdiction, they know they're caught between a rock and a hard place, so what do you do? They put up a smoke screen. They keep us focused on the rubbish. The big issues don't get dealt with. The big issue in this country that must be dealt with, must be dealt with, is the issue of sovereignty. It is the issue of title to land. I would propose, and I think it's a fair, a fair proposition, that given that the, the monarch and the Parliament of Great Britain, both being legal entities under international law, should be liable for the value in compensation should be liable for the value of all titled lands to which they claim possession, those monies should be paid to the Aboriginal people or the land returned. But we can't take the land back because there, because there are honourable Australian people, who are not politicians by the way, there are honourable Australian people who have worked hard. 
They've paid for their land. They've bought their house. They've built their house. They've raised their families in those homes. We don't have the right. We would be no less a snake than the British Parliament if we stole their land and houses off them. We can't do that. But what we can do under international law is we can take the British Parliament and its monarch as legal entities before the appropriate jurisdiction and seek a determination on two points. The first off is the quantum of compensation for the value of our lands. The second is a declaration as to whether or not British law, under international law, can be used in our lands, particularly against us. Now, British subjects in this land, yeah, okay, fine. They, uh, they're subject to British law, I suppose, because that's what the law says. But I'm not a British subject. The Queen of England, as far as I'm concerned, has no jurisdiction over me. And she should remain where she is in England. That is her abode, that's her home, that's her country, that's her jurisdiction. Stay there. We don't want you here. And don't come to Australia pretending to be the Queen of Australia. You are not the Queen of Australia. You can't be the Queen of Australia. Your law says you can only be the Queen of one realm. Not two. Under international law, you can't be the Queen of Australia. Under our constitution, the constitution refers to one monarch, and that is Queen Victoria, her heirs and successors. Okay? And it's referring to Queen Victoria in her capacity as the monarch of the Parliament of Great Britain. Not Queen Victoria in her purported capacity as the monarch of Australia. The term monarch of Australia is never mentioned in the constitution. Yet, here we go, we've got the politicians, these wonderful people, who give themselves... 14% pay rises in the middle of the night when everyone else is getting denied 2.5% and they sit there and they say not only are they lying through their teeth at us and, and taking our money and destroying our land and selling the Aboriginal people's natural wealth uh, to corporate monsters, they won't even pay us the royalties for the stuff they're stealing from us. That's how uncouth, unethical and immoral these people are. And it's about time this was dealt with. We can't continue down this road. Australia is not that blind that we can't see the truth and taking our money and destroying our land and selling the Aboriginal people's natural wealth uh, to corporate monsters they won't even pay us the royalties for the stuff they're stealing from us that's how uncouth unethical and immoral these people are and it's about time this was dealt with we can't continue down this road Australia is not that blind that we can't see the truth we need to do something um, we, we have a look around the place now and we see all these lies that are being told. We, we get told that, that the Queen of Australia is the Queen of Australia pursuant to the Australia Act 1986. As I asked a magistrate one day, well, which one are we talking about here? Are we talking about the Australia Act Australia 1986? Or are we talking about the Australia Act UK 1986? Because the Australia Act Australia gets its authority from the Australia Act UK. The preamble to the Australia Act UK says that the governments of Australia gave consent to the British Parliament to make this law for us, called the Australia Act, which gives authority to the Queen to act as the Queen of Australia. Well, that mechanism might work, except for one small thing. Nowhere did the Parliament, any of the governments of Australia, ever ask the people of Australia who own this place whether or not we wanted them to consent to a foreign power making a law for us. That law has never been registered with the United Nations as a, as a reciprocal treaty. That is required under international law. You know, these people were that drunk and that full of their own self-importance that they even failed to dot the simplest I or cross the simplest T. They were so eager to sell out and to undermine and to belittle the integrity of the Australian people, in particular the Aboriginal people and our sovereignty in this land, that they did everything without even considering whether or not someone was going to look at it. Well, not only have we looked at it, we've pulled it apart down to the atom. And we're aware of where we stand. And where we stand is outside of your jurisdiction. Your jurisdiction has no authority in our land. That's the cold hard fact. Any judge who sits under a British coat of arms and claims that it's his court or her court had best wake up to the fact that it's not. And if they're serving, we only have to look at the uh, case of Sue versus Hill in the High Court of Australia, where the High Court determined that Queen Elizabeth is a power foreign to the Commonwealth of Australia because she's the Queen of England. 
Now, if she can't be anything other than the Queen of England, she certainly can't be the Queen of Australia. If the laws that create the position of the Queen of Australia have not been lawfully created, pursuant to both domestic Australian, domestic English and international law, then she's not the Queen of Australia. Now, I'm not real bright, but they must be dumb. They must be really, really dumb. If they, First of all, they think they can get away with it, and second of all, they put this rot in place. Now, why is it that, that Aboriginal people are incarcerated at a rate that is phenomenally beyond our proportion in the community? Why is it that we die younger? We have diseases, Aboriginal people in this country, in, in, in remote communities, have diseases in this country that have been annihilated in third world countries. It is genocide. It is all it is. The governments of Australia are trying to wipe out the Aborigine people. First of all, they tried assimilation, integration, and every other sort of Asian you can think of. But that didn't work because we're too resilient. Hybrid vigour. Can't wipe it out, brothers and sisters. Simple as that. And they better get their head around that one. If our parliamentarians have any integrity, and that is if capital letters, bold print, underline, 48 point font in a 12 point font sentence. If our parliamentarians have any integrity, it's about time they sat down and spoke to us and dealt with us as the sovereigns that we are and mind their place and realise that they must come to us and do a deal. They must come to us and make amends for what's happened in the past because until they do, they're nothing more than liars, cheats and thieves themselves. They are committing the crime. They're endorsing the crime. They're assisting and aiding and abetting the crime. Whether or not they will openly acknowledge that, you know, well, it's not debatable, they just won't. They don't have the integrity. But the fact is they're going to have to. This will not go away. This information's out there in more forms than they can possibly think is possible. There are more people out there every day that are becoming aware of the fact. And there won't be riots in the street, there won't be bloodshed. It's just a simple, sorry, no jurisdiction. Let's have a look at this. If the Australian government, and Australia is a signatory to the, uh, to the uh, or a, 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 a member of the United Nations, we are a member on the basis of the equal sovereignty of Australia and England. If that is the case, no law of the British Parliament can be used here. It's an offence under international law. It is against the, the, uh, the uh, Charter of the United Nations. And if someone attempts to use British law against you in this land, in Australia, they are committing an act of war pursuant to Section 51 of the, uh, uh, sorry, Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations. It's really very simple, you know. And th this is not open for debate. This all I'm stating is cold, hard fact. Um, there's, there's, there's no way around this, you know. We get dragged into court, and we're, we're, we're told by the court that that even though we don't even understand what's going on inside their law pursuant to their jurisdiction, that we have to stand there and cop it. The, the British Crown gets its judge and one of its own legal experts or practitioners to represent us and say, oh yeah, my client pleads guilty when, our, when his client doesn't plead guilty. The client's not subject to the law. How can he plead guilty to it? You know, it's about time all this, this rot was addressed. The time's come. And it doesn't matter what I say, and it doesn't matter what Kevin Rudd says, and it doesn't matter what John Howard says, Kevin Rudd will go the same way as John Howard. John Howard is now wallowing in oblivion. Okay? It's as simple as that. Have a look, have a look what happened to him. After 11 years of progressively, progressively degenerating the psyche and the, the spirit of the Aboriginal people in his own mind, not in actual fact, but in his own mind, he thought he'd done a good job. He thought, well, gee whiz, I've been the Prime Minister of Australia for 10 or 11 years and I've done a really good job. I've, I've really kicked the blackfellas in the guts. I've ignored their rights. I've ignored their privileges. Um, I'm, a real, I'm a really good Anglo-Saxon Australian. Well, Mr Howard, you are a disgraceful person. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Your staff have informed you of where I'm coming from, as you're fully aware. Um, the time's come for Australia to stand up as one. We've got people in Australia, like, as I said before, I hate the term white Australia, black Australia, but, but non-Indigenous Australia um, will probably not be aware of the fact that the High Court of Australia has passed a judgment that says, if you own land, um, you don't own it. The only rights you've got is to walk on it and pay government charges in respect of it. You're free to hold it, freehold land, 
you're free to hold it till the Crown wants it back. And it's not even our Crown that wants it back. You know, they stole it once from the Blackfellas. Don't think they won't steal it off you. Have a look at a case called Bone versus Mothershaw. Judgment handed down in the High Court of Australia on the 3rd of October 2007. Have a look what the judge said about your rights if you own freehold... Oh, sorry, sorry. Have a look what the judge says about the absence, the utter absence of your rights as a landowner if you think you own your land under freehold or fee simple title. You really need to wake up. The only sovereignty in this country that can protect your land if you own it under British title is Aboriginal sovereignty because under British title, under British sovereignty, they're going to come and take it off you the same way they think they took it off us. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I was a little kid, I was taught one very, very basic tenet. And that was, if you take something that doesn't belong to you, you are a thief. Now, I'm not sure if the head of the Church of England can comprehend that simplistic description of the fact because she would have to be the most monumental thief on the planet at this point in time. Still raping and pillaging and stealing our natural resources for her own good, for her own personal wealth. How much does this person want? How much does she need? This is part of our land. No wonder they want it. Too bad they don't got it, because it's not theirs. The thief never owns what they take. How much does this person want? How much does she need? This is part of our land. No wonder they want it. Too bad they don't got it, because it's not theirs. The thief never owns what they take. And the fact is that this message is getting out across the planet. The fact is that people will be supporting us, and, and people are supporting us, in huge volumes. You might be asking, how do we get the resources to do this, to get this message out? The resources are being donated. I'm telling you the truth. Have a look at the Pacific Islander Protection Act, 1872, 1875. Have a look at the Act of Settlement 1701. Have a look at Section 127 of the Constitution. Ask yourself, if you, if you were told that you weren't part of the Commonwealth of Australia, and then the Commonwealth of Australia changes its law and says, oh, but hang on, we're now going to include you. Change your laws, do what you want. I'm still on the outside of it. It's as simple as that. No Aboriginal person on the continent of Australia is subject to British law. We are not British subjects. Anybody who is born in this country is not a British subject. If you're an Australian citizen, as they call it, go to England. See if you can get in through the domestic gate. See if you get spun around and sent back over to the aliens gate. I'll ask you the question. If you have to enter your Queen's domain as an alien, is she not alien to you too? And if she is an alien to you, how can she be your monarch? How can she be your queen? Let's have a look at the laws. Let's have a look at the laws in this country. Have a look at how judges are supposed to be appointed. Where's their writs of commission? Huh? The legal process that should be followed to appoint the Governor-General. The last five Governors-General of Australia have not been lawfully appoint appointed. There are no orders in the Privy Council that are, that are viewable that, that show that any of the last five Governors-General were lawfully appointed. <laughs> the current Governor-General, who's just about to get the flick, Jeffrey Stevens, or whatever his name is, Major General, he was appointed by John Howard. Now, that may not mean much on the surface, but I'll ask you a question. How can... We've got a constitutional monarch and a foreign power. We've got the Prime Minister of Australia, who's a solicitor, so he can be trusted. We've got the Prime Minister of Australia, who says, hang on, I'll give the Governor-General, whose office is above his, because he's just a member of the executive government, he says, I will give him up here vice-regal authority in the name of a foreign power. Pardon me? A and that power will be exercisable in this land. What? Now, there's an easy way of resolving this. And the best way of dealing with this is this. When you're dragged into court, ask the magistrate or the judge to prove their jurisdiction. Ask them to prove it. Show a writ of commission. You know? Signed by the appropriate British authorities, registered with the British Privy Council. Privy Council. Yeah. Ask, ask for the same. Ask for the, the writ of commission for the Governor of the State or the Governor General. 
ask, ask for any of these documents that, that, that are listed as being absolutely necessary to keep in, keep in check and in place. The chain of command from the Crown, who apparently is the Crown here, where is the, the line of authority? Because if there's a discontinuance in that line, there is no authority for the person at the bottom of the pile. You know, because as much as the judges would like to lord over us that they're the judge and they're, oh, this is my court, okay, well and good, but you're at the bottom of the pile when it comes to the, your lineage of power. The buck stops with you. That starts up there and that comes down. If there's a break in that, if you can't prove that you are in fact a judge, a magistrate or a justice, whatever you want to call yourself, you have no jurisdiction, you have no authority, you're a lie. You're a liar. Nothing more, nothing less. You know? <laughs> the ironic thing is, I suppose these judges that are sitting on the benches would, would, would be the first to chastise their own children if their own children lied to them. And these people are not telling lies, they're living lies. You know? And, and they are crucifying people's lives in order to maintain their own lie. They're destroying people in order to maintain this fast that they are and that their system is. I don't want to tear Australia to pieces. I love my country. I'm doing this. I'm putting my life on the line because I do love my country. And I love my country enough to, to, to actually research what the truth is about my country. And my country is more than a cesspit for the dumping of British criminals. Okay? How about the two boys that killed the Bulger kid in England? Huh? The Pommy sent them over here. When they finished with them, they sent them over here. And what did our government do? Straight up the Queen's butt. Let's take them. We'll bring them into Australia. Yeah? No, thank you. We don't want your scum here. You know? We've been saying that. Australia's got the same problem now that we had 200 years ago. Boat people. You know what I mean? It's a problem that has to be resolved. Let's keep Australia Australia. But let's start putting in place a remedy to the lies that have been told. Let's start putting in place a remedy to the theft that has occurred in this land. Let's start putting in place a mechanism whereby the Aboriginal people of this land can just be brought up to the same level as everyone else, you know, in respect of health, housing, infrastructure, education, not your education. We don't want to be taught any more lies. We're awake up to your crap. We want our own education taught. We want our own history and culture taught to our own people because ours is true, yours is not. And regardless of what happens, 100 years from now, Mr Rudd, Mr Howard, regardless of what happens, you people will be known. You will be remembered as being wise. If Mr Rudd's got the opportunity to do something about it. Um, I found Mr Rudd's apology, I must go here with this. I found Mr Rudd's apology on the 13th of February. I found the date ironic. Um, but on the 13th of February, when he apologised, he made a... a uh, an unconditional apology, but reserved in respect of compensation. Well, any apology which doesn't afford a compensatory measure in respect of the, action, the actions that incited the apology is no apology. You know, if I slap you in the face and turn around and go, I'm sorry, that's not much of an apology, is it? What we've got here is we've got Kevin Rudd on that day. We're standing there going, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we took your kids off you. How many kids do we take today? It's got to stop, Mr Rudd. It's got to stop now. We can see through it and we can see past it. You know? If you claim that you are the eloquent man that you are, that you're the honourable man that you claim to be, because you are eloquent, honourable is yet to be determined. Your apology didn't mean much. But given under your law, this is the interesting thing, and Mr McClellan, the Attorney General, will probably get a bit of a shiver up my spine on this one. On the 13th of February, you set an amazing precedent, an incredible precedent. What you did was, you established in the highest court of this land, which is the Parliament, you established that regardless of the nature of the crime that is committed in this country, a person merely has to offer an, a, 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 a verbal apology and there is a complete legal remedy to all compensatory issues. And what are you going to do, Mr. Mr. Rudd, Mr. McClellan, when people, everyone, when, when everyone who's committed a crime turns up in court and says, oh, excuse me, Your Honour, I'm sorry, off I go. Because that's what you did. Can you see the moronicism of that? Can you see the absolute lack of integrity? Huh? 
Can you sue me? Ah. I drove my car drunk, I wiped out a family on the highway, I turned up the court and I said, oh, sorry. Oh, good on you. How would you feel, Mr. Rudd? I'll run a question past you. And past everyone. How would you feel if someone came screaming up the street, 50 k's over the speed limit, and run over one of your children, or your wife, or your sister, or your brother, and then turn around, walked into court and said, oh, gee, I'm sorry. Sorry I took your family off you. Catch you later. And that was the only legal remedy that you were afforded. How would you feel? Because that's, that's how the Aboriginal people of Australia feel in respect of Mr Rudd's apology. I drove my car drunk. I wiped out a family on the highway. I turned up the court and I said, oh, sorry. Oh, good on you. How would you feel, Mr Rudd? I'll run a question past you past everyone. How would you feel if someone came screaming up the street, 50 k's over the speed limit, and run over one of your children, or your wife, or your sister, or your brother, and then turned around, walked into court and said, oh, gee, I'm sorry. Sorry I took your family off you. Catch you later. And that was the only legal remedy that you were afforded. How would you feel? <laughs> Because that's, that's how the Aboriginal people of Australia feel in respect of Mr Rudd's apology. And I'm quite sure that there are a number of um, public servants from the Aboriginal community in Australia who are getting paid to uphold the government's line. Um, those people excluded, those people who don't have the integrity to, to uphold the truth and be honourable to their own community, um, I suggest this to you. Um, maybe you should stand down from your position and have a really good look at what you've sold yourself for because you've really sold your soul if that is the position if you if you can't see the truth and you would prefer that things just continue the way they are so you can just maintain your job sort of thing um, you really need to have a look at your own levels of integrity you really need to have a look at it let's have a look at what's happening in New South Wales in respect of Aboriginal land um, We've got, a, we've got a state government that is laundering land, crown land, through the Aboriginal Land Council system. And what are they doing? They're handing over crown land to the Aboriginal Land Councils, local Aboriginal Land Councils, and then they turn around and they put in an administrator. And while the administrator's in, he'll turn around and sell the land to Macquarie Bank, or some other bank, or some other interested party. And then the administrator goes and the local members of the Land Council are none the wiser. Um, 15, over 15,500 lots of prime crown land in 2007 alone were handed over to the New South Wales Land Council. The, the number of those lots that have been sold by administrators appointed by the state to local land councils would shock you. Who they were sold to when you consider where the ex-premier Mr Bob Carr works, who they were sold to, and the mechanism whereby that was done, would disgust you. Mr Carr put in place a mechanism whereby the Minister for Local Government is the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. So what happens? Crown lease lands held at, held, passed across to the Land Council, an administrator is appointed to the Land Council. The administrator applies to the Minister for Local Government, is also the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, to have the land rezoned. The land's rezoned, freehold gets sold. They're not giving land back to Aboriginal people, they're just using Aboriginal people as stooges to launder their own land, or to launder our land rather, back into the possession of a bank or some other multinational corporation. This has got to stop. Once again, all we have here is the theft of Aboriginal land and the living of a lie. Let's face it, you know, um, the truth is the truth. These are issues that are going to have to be dealt with. And if non-Indigenous Australians believe that they're exempt from this sort of behaviour by the Crown, <laughs> by the government, um, you really, really need to stop and think about it. Because whatever they do to the Aboriginal people today, they will do to you tomorrow. They will try it on us, they will perfect the process, and that will happen to you.
we need to deal with this. We need to get on with things and we need to get Australia back on track as a nation, not as a company registered in the American Securities and Exchange Commission. And you want to have a look. The Commonwealth of Australia is nothing more than a corporation registered in the Securities and Exchange Commission in America with a registered address of 1601 Massachusetts Avenue, Washington, care of the Australian Embassy. The state of New South Wales is nothing more or less than a Brigalow Corporation. The bylaws of that Brigalow Corporation, interestingly enough, only apply to those people who are engaged or employed by that corporation. Not me, because I'm not engaged or employed by the state of New South Wales. I'm a free, sovereign being. I'm a free man on the land. I am not a number in their book. I am free and I'll live free. I am not subject to their law. I refuse to be subject to their law. And I know that I will ultimately, I suppose, get dragged into their court again and we'll go through the same process we've been through before where the Crown and the court can't prove jurisdiction over me. Um, Nonetheless, they'll do it. Why? Because they can't be seen to be allowing someone to tell the truth because the truth is damaging to their lie. It's like when, see, they can bring a bit of darkness into our light and their bit of darkness just stays with them. When we bring a bit of light into their darkness, our light permeates the room. That's what they're scared of. The truth will set you free. If you understand what the truth is in respect of the law, it will set you free. Their law has no jurisdiction in this land. It is British law. Every law that stems from the Constitution is a British law because the Constitution itself is British. So everything that hangs off it has got to be British. It's as simple as that. We don't want the law here. Thank you.